and good morning. We are in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. The title of our message is Unashamed of the Gospel. Before we get into our text, let's pray and, and we'll begin. Lord, we thank you for who you are, the love, the grace, the mercy that you've shown us is so deeply rooted in your unchanging character. And because of that, we can depend on it. We can rely on it, rely on you. We thank you, Lord, for your word and for what it is to us as believers. It's the bread of life. It sustains us. It builds us up. It fills us. And Lord, may we come here this morning hungry for your word, hungry for your truth. May your spirit speak to us the truth of your word. And bear much fruit as you, as you embed your word deep into our hearts. As we come with this spiritual hunger, forgive us, Lord, for trying to find satisfaction, satiation elsewhere through idols and through, through the noise of this world. May you meet our greatest need of all, the, the need that we have to be in communion with you for our sins to be forgiven, to stand before you, Lord God, and to receive grace and mercy in times of need. And Lord, do we need it now more than ever? So fill us up, Lord God, at the point of overflowing. May it impact those around us. May your word bear so much fruit that, that others see it as it changes our lives and has that transformative uh, effect in us, in our souls, our spirits, Lord God. It's something that can only be attributed to your goodness and to your grace. So do a mighty work this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, we are continuing our verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of Romans. A nice and steady pace. I'm doing more than one verse, so it's, it's, it's as much four as, as much as I can give you this morning. Especially at this point, it's a very critical uh, point in which the, the letter uh, shifts gears. So verses 14 and 15, 1 through 15, that's the introduction. And for those of you that haven't been with us, the book of Romans is a, is a letter that Paul the Apostle is writing to the church in Rome. He's writing from Corinth, he's going on his way to Jerusalem, and he wants to go to Rome and eventually to Spain and beyond. And he tells them that, I want to go to Rome. As hostile as it is to Christians and the gospel, he wants to go there, fellowship with those who are there, and also spread the gospel to those who have yet to hear it at this point, in this early point of Christianity. And so he writes to them on his way to Jerusalem, and as we know, when he goes to Jerusalem, he's not going to get the warm welcome that he was hoping for. He's going to get arrested and, and accused, falsely accused, and eventually taken to Rome, not as a free man or even as a missionary, but yes, but no, uh, in chains, as a prisoner. But before then, he's writing this letter to encourage them, to bless them, and just laying down the theological truth surrounding the gospel, God's grace, his righteousness. Uh, and, and so for a lot of people, when they read the book of Romans, they're hearing a lot of this, these things for the first time, just how the grace of God, the gospel of God, works. So the title of our message is Unashamed of the Gospel. It seems to be the core of this particular section. That is to say, Paul's view of the gospel, what it means, and why he's unashamed of it. So let's read these four verses all together, and then we'll break it down one by one. It starts with verse 14. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, in the context of this chapter, Paul's talking about his desire to go to Rome and to share with them the gospel, to bless them, both the church, so those that have already received, those that have already believed in the resurrection and the grace of God through Jesus Christ, 
and those who have yet to receive. And he starts with that. I am under obligation to both Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Uh, so Paul's attitude towards the gospel is something that I kind of want to push us towards replicating. So firstly, Paul is under obligation to share the gospel. He's under obligation to share the gospel. So I have six points for us this evening. So pray for me. <laughs> uh, the first three have to do with Paul. The next three have to do with the gospel. But firstly, his view of the gospel is that he's under obligation to share it. So if you're using the old King James, it says that he, I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor to the, uh, the Gentiles, to the Greeks, and to the barbarians. And that word, it means legally bound. So one who owes someone else something. And we know first and foremost that Paul is under obligation. He owes it to Christ. We saw that in verse 5 when he says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. Speaking of Jesus, he says, for the sake of his name among all the nations, to share these, this good news. That's what gospel means. It means good news. So for the sake of of the name of Christ, to share this good news. But secondly, Paul is obligated to others. And a lot of times he says to Greeks and the Jews, or the Jew first and the Greek, we see that in verse 16. But here he says, I am obligated to both Greeks and barbarians. So basically, those who are Greek and those who are not. So barbarian, we might think of, I don't know what we think of, a caveman or something, but, but barbarians, as you guys probably already know, it's what Greeks thought of people who didn't speak Greek. Because when they heard that foreign language, to them it just sounded like bar, 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 like some kind of just nonsense. So they called them barbarians. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were uncivilized or, or whatever else. Uh, but rather it was just a language barrier. So those that know Greek and speak Greek and those who do not. Those who are wise and those who are not. Those who are foolish, those who are civilized, and pretty much anyone and everything in between, Paul is indebted to that individual to give them the gospel. So one, one way I've heard it described is this. And this is a different pastor. I didn't make this up, but just imagine this scenario for a moment. Imagine you're in debt. Some of us don't have to imagine that. I don't know. I don't know what you're, what you're about. But, you know, the, the scenario is that you're in debt so much to the extent that it's impossible. Impossible. Even if you work for every day for the rest of your life as much as you possibly could and make all the money in the world, you cannot pay that debt off. And someone pays that debt for you. That's Jesus. And not only do they pay off the, de the debt... They deposit into your account immeasurable riches. And then they instruct you to share those riches and to tell others what he has done for you, what he has done for me, he can do for other people as well. So our obligation lies in this, that we are obligated to the person who paid off our debt, our Redeemer, and we are obligated to the person who has called us and commanded us to tell and to share the good news of the man who's, pay, who's paid off our debt on the cross, to receive that gift, to receive those immeasurable riches, which aren't dollar bills, gold, or, or material things, but something greater, the salvation, the redemption, the cleansing of our souls from all sin. And so Jesus commands his disciples to go out and to share the good news, to make all disciples. And, 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 and what that person does with, with the riches that you share, that's up to them. They can bury it. They can get rid of it. They can reject it. And so rather than burying and keeping to ourselves what Christ has given us, we are called, Paul is called, he's indebted to invest it in other people, to share it with other people. Greeks and barbarians, wise and foolish, uh, and, and everything in between. 
Language barriers even weren't enough to deter Paul. Culture wasn't enough to deter Paul. A person's lack of intellect or, or, or abundance of intellect, education, none of that, none of that is a deciding factor for Paul when it comes to sharing the gospel, and neither should it be with us, because we come up with all kinds of excuses, like, oh, they're, they're, um, they're this political party or that political party, or they're younger than me or they're older than me, or they look different, or they speak differently, they don't even speak the same language as me. But for none, none of that was an excuse for Paul. I'm indebted to give these people the gospel. So firstly, he's obligated to share it. And secondly, he's eager. He's eager to preach it. We see it in verse 15. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And that word eager. It, it speaks of willingness and readiness. Not equipped. That doesn't necessarily mean you got the right stuff, but he's willing, knowing that the equipping comes from the Lord and not from his own educational background, because sometimes that's another uh, roadblock when it comes to sharing the gospel. Like, oh, I don't know enough. I mean, oh, I'm, I'm not. I'm, if you're a believer, you know the gospel because you've received it. That's the qualification of being a believer. And also you have the Spirit who enables you to share it even beyond your own natural capacity. And it has nothing to do with PhDs or education or reading tons of books on apologetics and evangelism. I love that stuff. I love it. I eat it up. But it's not what saves a person. What saves a person is the Spirit. The Spirit works when we share the gospel. Eager to preach. And Paul is eager to preach uh, to even you know, the non-believer, but also to you also who are in Rome. Now, that, that's interesting because the, the Roman church, I mean, they're, they're Christians. I mean, that's, that's what makes them part of the church. But he's eager also to preach to them that, that already know. So this really speaks of not just standing on the street corners and yelling out with the, the signs or whatever. You know, if that's what God's calling you to do, you know, go for it. But this speaks of a deeper uh, uh, discipleship, of forging and forming relationships. I mean, evangelism is, isn't always street witnessing and talking to strangers, though. Yes, it does involve that, and we do do that. But it's also, it, it, sometimes the hardest mission fields is those among people you already know, people you go to work with, people who are in your family. Uh, but those are the people that Paul wants to uh, share the gospel with as well, and so should we. I mean, that is a, is, a, is a sort of ripe mission field. Those opportunities are present all around us. And so Paul is talking about sharing the gospel uh, and, and forging disciples, even among the believers, uh, growing them in the faith uh, through sharing the gospel, even with them that have already received it. So eager to preach the gospel, and thirdly, he is unashamed unashamed of the gospel. And we see that in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we consider those first 15 verses, like I said earlier, the introduction to the letter. You've got the greeting, who it's written to, you know, some hellos and, and, and stating of intentions, but the gears kind of shift with verse 16, and this is what, what many refer to as the thesis of the letter, that is to say verses 16 and 17 are the core of this letter, the theme, setting up the whole rest of it to give us an understanding of, of the direction that Paul is going. And, and the first thing that he has to say is that I am not ashamed, or I am unashamed, depending on your translation, of the gospel. And I think Paul states this because there is a temptation. There is a temptation to be ashamed of the gospel. If there wasn't, I mean, Paul wouldn't bring it up. If, it, if there wasn't, Jesus wouldn't have brought it up. And, but he did so in Mark chapter 8, verse 38. He says, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will also will uh, be uh, ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. So just as, as by way of reminder, so far Paul has been beaten, uh, imprisoned, left for dead, chased out of town, mocked, laughed at, falsely accused, and arrested, betrayed by fellow Pharisees, fellow Jews, arrested by Gentiles, rejected 
uh, by those who, whom he proclaimed the gospel, and, and even abandoned, as we'll read later on, by, even by some Christians. So Paul has gone through a lot for the sake of the gospel, and he even refers to it as a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. So those who are religious, like the Jews, they, 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 they say, oh, no, that's wrong. That's not, that's not how God is at all. Those who think they're smart say, oh, well, no, that's dumb. I mean, the gospel is, is, is uh, archaic or whatever. And the world says you ought to be ashamed by such an antiquated Abrahamic religion who says that I'm a sinner. You know, why do you believe in all of that junk, all of that nonsense? But, but Paul is not ashamed because he knows it to be true, not just philosophically. This isn't just a, ph a philosophy, but in power. It has saved him from his sin and excites him to share that hope of glory with other people because he's so enraptured by the truth, and it is that, it's, it's the truth. Uh, because it's not, again, not just a way of thinking, but, the, but this powerful reality in which it's, it's been confirmed through what? The resurrection of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. So to be so enamored by the truth of the gospel, that the fear of men is subject instead of the fear of God, and the desire to obey Him. Now, that's, that's where we want to be as believers. And when we have those three adversaries, the world, the flesh, the devil, and it's gonna, of course it's going to pull us into discouragement and what? Shame. Into shame. You should be ashamed of yourself, or what, whatever nonsense the devil wants to whisper into our ears. But may the desire to obey Christ outweigh the desire to fall into the shame. Because Christ hasn't called us into shame, rather, but he's called us into, the, into his grace and into his obedience, into his redemption, and, and, and uh, not to be uh, uh, ashamed of ourselves or of himself and of the gospel. And again, that temptation, it is there. Let's, let's be honest with ourselves. The gospel is offensive. What do we say on, on week one? Get ready to be offended. The gospel is an offensive reality to many, even in ancient times. It's not something new. So we have many ancient sources that speak of Christians as being vile and evil and foolish and wicked and dumb and don't have anything to do with them, just ignore them. And if you want to be an idiot like them, go for it. We have ancient uh, uh, sources that speak of that, and, and one in particular, and I forget if it dates to the first or the second century, but basically it's this, uh, it's this graffiti of a man worshiping Jesus, but Jesus is depicted as a donkey nailed to a cross, and it says, oh, so-and-so worshiping his God. Like, look at this dummy worshiping, you know, another dummy or whatever else. That's the view of the Romans at the, during the time of Paul's ministry. And that often, you know, is the view of much of the world that we are sharing the gospel with. They say, why do you believe in that junk? Why do you believe in that? Because it's offensive. It calls out our sin and it says that the only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ. We cannot redeem ourselves. And so, I like what Pastor Timothy Keller said about this, he says that the gospel, by telling us that our salvation is free and undeserved, is really insulting. It tells us that we are sp such spiritual failures, that the only way to gain salvation is for it to be a complete gift. This offends moral and religious people who think their decency gives them an advantage over less moral people. The reality is, is that even you know, even today, most people are not atheistic. Most people believe in heaven and, and, and yes, even in hell. And most people don't think that they're going to hell because they think, I'm a good enough person. And why do they think that? Because they compare themselves to other people. Oh, you know, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than Hitler. I'm better than, you know, whoever else. And, and whatever we say to ourselves, they justify the, the sin that we do have. But as we know, God's standard is perfection. So the gospel is offensive to the idea that people are inherently good. It's offensive to those that think that they can work their way into heaven. It's offensive to those who would rather hold on to the very things that separated them from God. And in the midst of a culture that continues to prioritize not truth, but the privatization of faith, we have a choice. And by that I mean this, that the, the, the world typically doesn't have a problem with what you believe for the most part, but they think that you, you can believe whatever you want, but as long as you don't share it. Keep it to yourself. You want to, you want to, you want to think that way? You know, okay, fine. But don't spread it around. Don't share it. And if you do, it's a cause for shame in their eyes. But Paul is unashamed 
And he lists a few reasons. He, he talks about power and salvation. So as we, we get near this, the midway point, let's talk about that, the power of the gospel. And our first point is this. As it pertains to the gospel and its description in these two verses, firstly, we see this. The gospel is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. The, the Greek word is dunamis. It's used 120 times in the New Testament. And it's where we get the word dynamic dynamite, and, and, and a few others. So dynamic in the English, it means energetic, powerful, active. And, and that give, my hope, I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea. Dunamis itself, it means power, ability, and potential. One Bible commentator said this, the gospel is not advice to people suggesting that they lift themselves. It is power. It lifts them up. Paul does not say that the gospel brings power, but that it is power, and God's power at that. So again, the gospel, not just the mere concept or philosophy or even just the new religion, this good news, it, ha it, isn't, it doesn't just have power, it is power. And so I was reading this one, one book, and in it he describes a Syrian bishop in, from the 5th century who is describing the gospel and he likens it to a pepper. So he says a pepper outwardly seems to be cold, but the person who crunches it between the teeth experiences the sensation of burning fire. And I like, I like that analogy, right? So you got a habanero and it's cold on the outside or whatever, and it's got the black seeds on the inside and you bite into that bad boy and, well, you know what it is. So what appears to be a concept or a philosophy when you chew it, when you consume it, when you bite into it, you, 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 you experience that power and that power of God. And what does this power do? It's not the power of man, not the power of interesting ideas or cultural movements. It's the power of God unto salvation. So its power can be seen in a changed life in a forgiven sinner, reconciled to God, in the name that is written in the book of life. These miracles are happening every day. They've happened in our lives. Those of us have received the gospel, who have received Jesus. This miracle comes about by the power of God, the good news, the gospel. In Romans uh, 1 verse 4 describes it as such in the New Living Translation, he was shown to be the Son of God, that is Jesus, when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And what I find interesting is that people desire power. And the more I think about it, the more I realize is that's all of us. Some of us think that, oh, you know, I don't want power. I'm content where I am. But no, I mean, as far as I can tell, all humanity desires power to do a number of things, right? To, the power to change, the power to look better, the power to feel better, the power to be healthier, uh, to be more influential. And, and you notice how advertisements and businesses capitalize on our innate desire for, for power. I remember, you know, I, I remember being a kid, couldn't sleep at night, and looking at the TV at 11 o'clock, midnight or whatever, and watching the infomer infomercials. And they convince you, you need this. Right? You need this weird device that has one specific purpose, and you'll you take it out of the box and use it once, maybe. And, and even as a, as, a, as a young boy, I was convinced, like, oh, man, watching it at midnight, I, I need that Tupperware set. I can stick so much stuff in, that, in, those, in those containers or whatever nonsense that I thought that I needed, even as a child, right, desiring that power. And we have extraordinary power as people. And some of that is really God blessing humanity with the ability to, to take his creation and glorify him and to do stuff with him. Uh, but when that power uh, puffs us up or that creates that vacuum in our heart that desires more and more power. I mean, think about it. We have power in our smartphones. All of the world's collected information just available in our pocket. And think about it. how many of us have flip phones? You don't have to raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass anyone. And honestly, I think 
some of us it might even be a good change if we went back to a flip phone, but most of us don't. We have smartphones, iPhones, and Androids, and, and why? Because th those flip phones lack the power of a smartphone. Uh, and, and so man, being a very weak thing, powerless to change in any meaningful way, desires and longs for the, the, the power to change their lives for the better. Because again, remember, those, those words are linked, power and potential. So we see pe potential in that, that smartphone, or that opportunity, or that position, or that Tupperware set, and all the other stuff that we think that we need that will make our lives better, improve us in some way, but it never really does the trick. And yes, I mean, the great movements of the world, the, the, the advancements in medicine and uh, communication, I mean, it produced much, and yet we still die. We still suffer. We still sin. But God's power can transform. And it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, this is the, the, the New International Version, it says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And so God looks at us and says, yeah, they can make smartphones and Tupperware and, and commercials and, and TV and the idiot box and whatever else, but they can't save themselves. And so he sent Christ to save us. 1 Corinthians 1.18, along those same lines, it says, for the word of the cross is folly, it's foolish to those who are perishing. All right, so those who are rejecting it who are choosing to be dead in their sins. It's foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And we can talk about that being saved because as we've discussed this past few weeks, salvation is not just a ticket to heaven. It's not just a conversion. We say salvation like it just, like when were you saved? And we're, we're really talking about conversion. But salvation ex extends beyond that to, to the everyday life and continue continuing process of sanctification into the eternal state of glorification. But all that aside, there's power in the gospel to do what we cannot do apart from it, and it's the power of God. And the requirement, uh, you know, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To everyone who believes. So the gospel and its power is not bought, it's not earned, it's worked out, but it's not worked for. It's received, and it's received through faith, belief in Christ, the person whom the word of the gospel is centered on, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. So uh, there's a few ways to kind of view that verse, but personally I, I believe that Paul orders it as such because the gospel first came to uh, the Jewish community as Jesus was a Jew and fulfilled the Hebrew prophecies listed out in the Old Testament. You can do, study that for years and, and really not get to the bottom of that well, but just as a cursory statement, the Old Testament proclaiming Christ long before his uh, 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 ministry. And so the gospel first came to the Jews and then to the Greek, uh, the, the people of Israel, and then to those mess Messianic Jews went all over the world to share the gospel to everyone. But the restriction is this, to those who believe. There doesn't seem to be much of any uh, 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 restriction other than uh, one's own faith and where they place it. So it's for everyone, but received only by those who believe. And you know, as Jesus says, the, the road is, is narrow, not because uh, it's, it's inaccessible, but because he's the only way. Uh, he, he is the only way to, to God, and not everyone will, will go down that narrow road to believe and to receive. But, but secondly, the gospel has the power to deliver us, uh, the salvation uh, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then uh, to the Greek. So that word salvation, it, it means just that. It means deliverance, rescue. It's the Greek word soteria, which means literally safe and sound. It's related to our our, our phrase SOS. So there's safety in Christ. And apart from Christ, as you guys know, it's a terrible thing to be in the hands of the living God. God's wrath is burning towards all sin. But there's 
forgiveness and cleansing and redemption and safety in the arms of Christ, safety from the penalty of sin, safety from the despair of this world, safety from the tyranny, the tyranny of sin. We all sin. And even after, even after becoming Christians, we, we will continue to sin, unfortunately. But sin is no longer our tyrant, our despot, our, the ruler over our lives, or at least it shouldn't be. And if we go back, if, if we as believers go back to the authority of sin, we don't do so because we didn't have a choice. We do so out of willing disobedience and because we've relinquished our freedoms, the freedoms that we have in Christ to be free from the tyranny of sin. And so William Barclay, he says, the Christian salvation makes a man safe in a way that is independent of any outward circumstance. And we're, we're living in a world that's looking for deliverance, that's looking for rescue. And, and the thing about the world is that it's looking for rescue from the symptoms of sin. So, you know, the, the fallenness, the diseases, the... the broken homes and the education system and trying to patch stuff up as much as as they can trying to like glue together uh, 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 broken cisterns and the leaks continue and continue and continue but salvation doesn't just treat the symptoms of sin but the core issue the separation that we have from god and through the gospel we are connected to god and while we wait for eternity in this broken state, we are nourished by that connection and the symptoms of sin, fallenness, brokenness, addictions, and, and habitual sin, and, and, and uh, issue, issues of the mind, issues of the body. Those things are covered by His grace and by His forgiveness. And so with that slave and master metaphor that I want you guys to pay attention as we continue through Romans, because Paul brings it up a lot. Because remember, Rome, huge city, over a million people, probably half of them were slaves. And so Paul's speaking to them in language that they can understand, and that deliverance speaks of freedom from the slave master of sin. As we, as we talked about a few weeks ago, that those who sin are a slave to sin, whether they realize it or not. And so the salvation doesn't just exclusively refer to someone's conversion, but salvation encompasses everything about them. It redefines a person's status and position, the position of a believer for all eternity. Everyone who believes, again, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. That is to say, and when I say Greek, it doesn't mean you have to be Jewish or Greek. <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of metaphorical language for those who are, you know, uh, children of Abraham and those who aren't, uh, uh, being most of us this morning. And so in verse 17, it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The gospel reveals God's righteousness. This brings us to our third and our last point. We are saved through faith and live by faith. We are saved through faith and we live by faith. So this is a very interesting phrase here. It says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith. What's that mean? From faith, for faith. But it simply means that it's a matter of faith from start to finish. Does that make sense? It's a matter of faith from the beginning to end, so to speak. So you don't start with faith and then finish your salvation with works. You don't start with faith and then, you know, go to something else to kind of take care of the rest. Righteousness and the power of God and the righteousness that is revealed, it's a matter of faith. And this is confirmed all throughout the New Testament and even the Old, uh, that if in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, in the New King James, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so this is pervasive anxiety that a lot of people have about what God thinks of them. Uh, you know, do I, am, I, am I going to heaven? I'm going to, I'm go, am I, am I going to be saved? Am I saved? And, and kind of questioning that. And like, if you're in Christ... 
you know, that, that anxiety ought to be relinquished. If you know God as your Savior, as you know Christ as your Savior, if he has forgiven you of your sins and cleansed you from all unrighteousness, your confidence is not in your own ability or in your own works, but in that. And sometimes Christians feel like they have to work for God's favor. I mean, even God's favor and his view of, of us is not based on uh, what we've done, but the righteousness that he has imparted to us. The righteousness that he has given to us, the righteousness that is not our own, but is uh, uh, that of Jesus Christ. The perfect sinless life that he lived and that spiritual credit that he uh, naturally possesses has, has been imparted to us. That is the gospel message. So that word faith, it means belief, the conviction that something is true. And, and, and we want to emphasize that for a moment because sometimes we hear the words blind and faith kind of you know, sandwiched together, blind faith, faith is, you know, believing, and what is it, was it Mark Twain that said that faith is, um, faith is believing what you know is not true, or something silly like that, it was, uh, I don't know, I probably butchered it, but essentially, the, the, the idea that faith is just, um, got a blindfold on is not the reality, but, but rather, faith, in a biblical sense, and at the very least, according to the Greek, is based on a reality, a factual reality, a truth, and a conviction of that truth. And the strength of that faith and the, the value of that faith is based on whatever it's, whatever it's placed in. So when your faith is based on the risen Christ and not the dead prophet of, of whoever, as we, we talked about, and Joseph Smith is dead, uh, um, Muhammad is dead, uh, 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 Buddha is dead, all, all these messianic figures, so to speak, uh, are dead, but Jesus is alive, he is risen, and the value of your faith is so much greater uh, because of that fact. So the righteous, righteousness of God is not revealed by our effort, but rather by faith. So that, that word faith is significant, but also that word righteous, righteousness is significant. And when you think of the word righteous, in the English it might sound different from the word justice, but in the Greek, justice, just, righteousness, all of those words are very closely linked in their root words. So the righteousness of God is both salvation, deliverance, the, 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 the deliverance from our sins and from judgment that we have in Christ, but also the status that we now have as believers before a perfect and holy and just God who makes us holy. I mean, when you think of yourself, you don't, probably don't think of yourself as very holy, but if you're in Christ, that holiness has been imparted unto you. In Romans chapter 5, verse 17, and this is the New Living Translation, I like the way it's worded, it says, for the sin of one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness, for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Bible commentator William Barclay says this, if God justifies a sinner, it does not mean that he finds reasons to prove that he was right. Far from it. It does not even mean that at this point that he makes a sinner a good man. It means that God treats the sinner as if he had not been a sinner at all. That is what the righteousness of God means. It's not you giving a charity, walking old ladies across the street, or recycling or whatever we think makes us such a good person that the world might say, oh, I'm a good person because of these things and more, but rather the righteousness of God is the status that we've been given through faith in Christ that we are no longer having our sins counted against us, but our sins have been removed from us from the e as far as the east is from the west, which is, of course, this infinite point. And so Paul concludes this particular section, the righteous shall live by faith. This is a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2. This is Old Testament prophet. And just really quickly to paint the picture for you guys, is the, the Lord is warning the prophet about the coming judgment against Judah because Judah has been walking in sin for quite some time, or sin and rebellion, and they're going to be judged by the Chaldeans, by the Babylonians. These people, Habakkuk says, they're more sinful than we are. 
Why are you using them to judge us? And the Lord confirms that he's going to judge the Babylonians too. And so he, that, that's where this verse comes from. It's, it's Habakkuk 2, uh, and uh, it's quoted throughout the New Testament, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38. So in Habakkuk, God uses the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, as an example that they trust in their chariots, their armies, themselves, their strength, their abilities, their potential, their power. But the righteous, they will live by faith, not by their strength, not by their ability, not by their, their own uh, good deeds, but they will live by faith. And that faith is placed not in themselves, but in God. So we're not only saved by faith, but we live by that faith. And I heard one, one commentator describe it as such, that biblical faith is not a passive state of mind, but an active staking of one's life on the claims of God. So imagine, I mean, faith is not just like, oh, you know, look at that plane flying above me. It's going to stay up for as long as it needs to. Faith is actually being in the plane, being in the vehicle, being in the state. Which you're, you're staking your life on this, whatever it is, staying afloat. And it's entrusting all that you are in whatever the object you're placing your faith in. Not just to be saved. So not just a one and done ticket, but to live Life cannot really truly be lived for a believer apart from faith. So we believe the Lord. We have faith in him for salvation, but also that faith uh, uh, in his righteousness uh, rather than mine. Our faith is in his ability to work in us, to share the gospel, to share the gospel when I'm scared or feel inadequate or feel dumb. I have faith that, that, uh, that God can work despite all my flaws and all my faults. And I have faith that he can help me overcome my sin. I have faith that he can fill me when I'm at my most empty. And he can empty me when I'm most full of the nonsense and the noise of this world. And faith is powerful because it's not centered on our ability, on my ability or my righteousness. It's based on his righteousness, on his work, on his faithfulness to us. And he has given that righteousness so freely and fully uh, to, to, to me, to you, to us who believe in him. And so our faith can be placed wholly and fully and entirely on him in the same way that you would trust your vehicle to get you from point A to point B, and also knowing that, you know, if it explodes, then, then you're, you're, you're toast, you're done for. But rather, you know the same way that you, you think that your vehicle is reliable, you can know that God is reliable to save you from the consequences of sin and death and, and, and damnation and separation from him because the, 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 the faithful one has risen from the dead. Right? He has defeated death, sin, uh, uh, and has conquered these things. And so with the gospel, uh, uh, we, we remember and we experience as it is the power of God and the power to deliver us and the power to save us from ourselves, from our own sin. And a lot of times we feel powerless. A lot of times we feel hopeless and, and, and really got to take an evaluation of, of, of where your faith actually lies. Does it lie in the things of this world? Does it lie in, in political candidates? Does it lie in, 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 in the things of this world, in the... the, the, the the, the chariots, so to speak, and the armies of, of, of our own kingdom? Or does it rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ where he says, it is finished? And that faith doesn't just save us, but allows us to live. It allows us to live in this crazy world and not just live and survive and kind of just scrape by with bruises and, and whatever else, but to thrive, to thrive in those areas of life knowing that he is able to accomplish his good and perfect will. Not because we're so great, but because he is faithful, because he is able, because the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives in us for those who believe and those who do not. My encouragement to you is to, is to receive the free gift of salvation. Don't just go through the motions of, of, of one fallen hope to the next, just like, oh, this is going to be the next big thing, and, and waiting for that next, I don't know, Amazon package that you think that you desperately need, but your soul is longing for so, so much more. It can only be found 
in Christ and for the believer that is perhaps ashamed of themselves and ashamed of the gospel, remember how powerful it's been in your own life, how its power continues to transform and shape the face of God's church, and how it continues to work in us, uh, and, and how, it continue to, uh, it, it, how it can continue to work in us uh, should we yield ourselves over uh, to that powerful uh, work of God that he's doing even now. You don't have to be given to fear. You don't have to be given to shame, embarrassment. And, and you know, as we live in this, these mortal bodies, of course, fear and embarrassment uh, and, and, and shame and all these things, they come, they go. But to not let those things tether us to this world, but instead to be tethered and connected and, and, and dependent on the grace, on the power, on the righteousness, on the faithfulness, on the love of God that does what we cannot do apart from Him. As it was said earlier, apart from Him, we can do nothing. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your faithfulness and Your goodness. You work in a way uh, that, 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 is, is, that cannot be re replicated by natural means, Lord. So forgive us if we try to fix our lives through philosophies that are empty. Help us, Lord, to yield to you in complete obedience and faith. And may our obedience be a response to the work that you've done in our lives and the spirit that has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you, Lord, that we get to live by faith not just be saved by it, but may it color every aspect of our life. Grow us in our faith, Lord, and may you strengthen it according to your word as we continue to read, pray, seek, and obey you. May our faith be fortified and not shaken up by the winds and the waves and the nonsense of this world. You're so much greater than these things, so help us to find our stability, our foundation in you. We love you. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.